Ngongi has the professional capacity to deliver on your external and internal audit assurance requirements. Visit ngongi.com for more. Welcome back. Mervyn King and I are talking about human capital in the workplace with our guests Derek Yach and Paul Norman. I want to talk about stress. Is the average employee today much more stressed than they were, say, 10 or 20 years ago because of the information age we live in? And let's say in South Africa, we live in pretty stressful environments here. I'm not sure if they're more stressed. Um, I think the awareness of stress is rising and the awareness of broader aspects of mental health, I think, are far greater. And there's no question that you could argue that for the case that they're more stressed, um, people are worried about their employment, they're worried about hiring and firing practices, pressure of time and so on. But I think in past years there probably were equivalent pressures. I think what's more important to say that we have tended to neglect these issues and neglected the broad area of mental health at enormous cost um, to our employees and their families. But Paul, because we live in the information age, <laughs> we have smartphones, we have iPads, you're always on call. Surely that has to be to raise, to raise the stress of the average employee. Well, I think in our experience, certainly, I mean, it's, it's a consequence of the industry that we're in, but I think the, with all the benefits that it's brought, um, the downside is, as you say, you never switch off. So, and, and there's an expectation in the current sort of uh, environment that once somebody sent you an email or an SMS or yeah. whatever, in fact, you've got it, you should be responding immediately. Mm. And I think also with increasing globalization, and MTN's no exception to that, you have, uh, people tend to work seven days a week in the sense of that they're on and off because they are, you know, in our case we have the Middle East and they work on weekends when we off and so forth. And so that combination sets up an environment where you really are never off and there's an expectation of response immediately. Mm. And I think that increases the, the level of, of uh, people's experience of the stress that they're going through. Mm. And the level of adrenaline, no doubt. Yes, <laughs> yes. Then, what's your view? Are we more stressed today? Uh, I think the answer is yes. And I think it's a, a big brother uh, mentality amongst employees. They are being watched more and they can be for example, the long and hushed phone call in the office. We're all on electronic uh, telephone systems. So a lot of companies today do random sampling. They will call for your printout of your telephone account and they will see twice a week you phone a number and you speak for 15 minutes. Who is that number? Oh, it's a supplier. Mr. Roberts, please come into my office. Please explain this phone call. And there are these red flag tests being happen happening in companies today because of uh, electronic information. So employees are feeling Big Brother is with them all the time. And then there's the question of does a company stop an employee using uh, emails, personal emails and things altogether? I don't think that's plausible. I don't think it's possible. Then you get a question of how much, what time can be spent in personal matters on phone calls and emails and what not. And this causes an amount mm. of stress, I believe. And it's all become very complicated, hasn't mm. it? Sorry, and if I can just comment there, I think the issue also is that, you know, we, we were constantly worried about sort of work-life balance issues. And I think what's happening more, in, to, to use your term of integrated, is, is work-life integration. And you're finding more and more that there's no, you, you can't separate the two and it's about how you integrate them in a way to sort of make mm. your life work better. And Derek, surely we have worse work-life balance today than 20 years ago. Um, again, I'm, I'm sure in some sectors we do, but if you think of the, the stress discussion we just had, and think of the blue-collar worker or the manual labourer um, over the last century. Um, everything that Mervyn said about being, being monitored and watched and carefully focused every minute of their day on a factory floor or in a mine has been under pressure. Maybe it's the fact now that the white collar workers are now being subject to the same oversight that in the past era the blue collar workers have been getting a bigger discussion around stress yeah. that was always there. Um, I, th but I think the issue of stress, you could say, well, um, is it something we should terribly worry about or are there bigger mental health issues we should worry about? And I get concerned that stress is put out as a generic huge problem 
when maybe it's not. If you speak to colleagues um, from the mental health world who've reviewed what's going on in the workplace, they would argue that there's a certain amount of stress that's actually desirable su for success in a company, um, white and blue collar workers, but there are some aspects of mental health that we just don't want to talk about. So it's, such yeah, as what? Such as depression at work, um, or anxiety at work, or anger, um, and things where we could be doing something about. Some of them are related to the nature of the work, some of them are related to a modern era of sleep deprivation. Some of them are related just to the fact that we have stigmatized people with mental health and give them lower value than we do with people with physical health, so they're less likely to be encouraged to seek care where it could happen. Paul, how serious is depression at work? I mean, if I look at, I think it certainly it's, it's more prevalent. Um, it's one of those things that I think are, it's difficult to, de to detect in a layman's terms, but you see it coming through in a number of ways in the sense that people struggle to cope with uh, a lot of the, the sort of day-to-day -day issues. So my experience is certainly that there's been a growing uh, sort of, say, let's say, presentation of that, uh, th that sort of uh, a disease in, in the organization. But, but certainly, um, you know, it's not a, it, 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 I think it's more around how a company manages it. And I think in that instance, <coughs> it's about creating the right environment. Um, it's, it's prevalent, and I think as you state, it's from a, from a societal perspective, it's there. But as companies, you have a role to play in ensuring that you create an environment where you possibly have a better uh, chance of, of not exacerbating Yeah, and where you're free to talk about it. But Norman, where does one draw the line? You know, we all want to work for a caring company. But surely there have to be parameters. I mean, surely you can't run to the company um, and, and deal with and, and not expect the company to deal with all your problems in the world, uh, such as depression. As Margaret Thatcher said, individuals must get off their backsides and help themselves. <laughs> and that's exactly... And that's why she was <laughs> called the Iron Lady. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, a, that's the situation. But if you go into a company and they haven't got what we were talking about earlier, a strategy where you get buy-in, and unfortunately some companies have a dichotomy in strategy. And I think particularly of state-owned enterprises. We have, um, uh, in a compact with government or in the very memorandum of incorporation of the company, that the company has to do certain things which are socio-political. And then they have to do other things, which is their money-making side. That creates anxiety inside the company. I was asked to go and talk as a consultant to one of our major SAEs, which will remain nameless, and I was introduced on this and that and the other and I started by saying good morning have you all taken your Prozac this morning <laughs> and, and there was laughter and I said well you aren't you schizophrenic because you have to you have to fill two strategies and how do you do that so you, it actually starts creating an anxiety and and it creates um, depression in the workplace yeah and and it's very difficult to get that buy-in to achieve things when you've got this dichotomy of a strategy okay so here's a contentious one in my opinion i come across very few employees who are happy at work mm. is that just my my perspective well, i guess you haven't been to vitality or discovery lately <laughs> <laughs> well said. or to no, or MTN. Or even the company i was at before pepsico I think when you have an inspired, um, Mervyn said that when you, that from the top, if the, the, the scene is set by an inspiring leader, if the nature of the work is seen and felt to be fulfilling, and you can create all those opportunities, uh, if you don't have a lot of, of people who are hanging around waiting for their pension date, which I think is a function often of the state or the semi-state structures more than the private sector, you're more likely to have uh, increased prevalence of happiness at work. Mm. Yeah, and, and th this is really um, getting back to it's humans dealing with humans. Mm. Yeah. And let's be honest, not too many humans are actually nice to every mm. single human or animal that they come across. Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, we measure our engagement levels at least once a year. I mean, but it's in a regular form in another throughout the year. But um, what, we, what we specifically focused on is this sort of issue of how on a number of dimensions the staff are connected and, and we, of course that way that goes up and down for various reasons um, but I think the important thing is that leaders of an organization have to be aware of that 
and we have to have strategies around how we sort of respond to those changes that are taking place. But I think fundamentally it's about how you create a sense of meaning for your staff and whether you're going through tough times or not, it's the messaging that you send, it's the way you behave, it's this, it's showing symbolically that you are actually right. There's, a, there's no difference between what you say and how you mm -hmm. behave. And through all of that is, is maintaining that connection with the staff. And certainly our experience has been that and MTN has been through various sort of uh, difficult times in different countries and so forth uh, throughout the last 20 years. And that's been one of the key things that we've driven to, to ensure that level of engagement. And Derek, tell us what companies should be doing about health in the workplace. What is best practice right now? Well, <laughs> I think it does start, as say, with, with the CEO and the leadership of the company. It's then reinforced uh, very much by having uh, the physical environment making healthy practices, the easy practices, whether it's ensuring it's smoke-free, healthy food at work is, is available, that there is an activity opportunity. It's then also creating the incentive structures for people to be rewarded as their health behavior improves. So this sort of vitality program where you try and encourage people over the long course of their career to um, evolve to higher and higher levels of health. Um, and I think when you start doing that, um, you start also then wanting to engage the families and the local community. That has a big reinforcing fac uh, factor. And we're seeing that there are a growing number of companies here. If you look at the companies who win the um, Healthy Company Index um, Award, a large number of them in this country are starting to exemplify these kind of practices. Yeah, so in the words of Jerry Springer, be kind to each other. <laughs> we have to leave it there. <laughs> thank you so much, all my guests, and thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Now is the time for change. Doing business in the 21st century was proudly brought to you by Ngongi the external and internal audit assurance providers. Log on to ngongi.com to find out.